synonyms for horrendous, abhorrent, appalling, atrocious, awful, disastrous, frightful, ghastly, gruesome, harrowing, hideous, horrible, horrid and dire. And that's just Scott Brown. Fucking shit. Welcome to episode 6 of the History Boys Abroad podcast. Today we're going to kind of uh, change things up a little bit. We're not going to talk about the historical aspect first because of that rake of pish from last night. So Celtic made the journey to Gibraltar. Uh, and before the game I made this kind of uh, reference on Twitter about how if we lost the headline could be uh, Celtic didn't land in the Rock of Gibraltar, the Rock of Gibraltar landed in Celtic. Yeah. And I didn't think it was going to ever be used, but after that fucking pitch tonight, then maybe it can be. So what did you think of the game? Where to begin? Like, <laughs> I'm kind of numb from it. And it felt it felt like a friendly. Aye. When we were watching it, it just felt it felt very surreal. It felt like we were going through the motions. It felt like, like the Maribor game at the weekend, I'd planned to talk about that, which was shite. But it felt like that. There was just nothing from Celtic. And I'm still, you know, we're recording an hour and a half after the game finished. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to digest it, trying to avoid social media and like trying not to go on like certain forums. <laughs> but it's difficult to really, to really break it down. But I'm, I'm going to just start by asking a simple question: What does Scott Brown offer as a football player? Uh, I don't know. Like, I don't know how he survived this long and. Sometimes I think that maybe in the past it was good. I remember, see the season where uh, Neil Lennon lost the league, but the second half of the season when he was against uh, Walter Myth was like the best we ever played under Neil Lennon. It was a four four two. It was Commons on the left and it was uh, Scott Brown on the right. Yeah, and that's the only time I can remember Scott Brown performing for Celtic when he was playing in that kind of right hand side of midfield. Other than that, I don't know what he offers us. As I, I don't know what he offers it offer tonight. His passing was absolutely terrible. I mean, I think the the captain's armband has given him this sort of bulletproof shield, where he doesn't seem he seems to avoid being dropped when he is really, really not good enough for our team. And it's not just tonight. It's not even the first, second, third, fourth, fifth time. It's we've said this over the years. He's he's coming up to get a a, a testimonial in the near mm -hmm. future, like in the next couple of years, and he's just like I've, I, I'm I'm quite a positive Celtic fan. I'm quite optimistic, and he, he's just tonight was just and you know the the thing that got me about tonight was all his fucking chat and the in that big interview he done with was it Craig Aye. Spears mm -hmm. and he was talking about. You know, I've had three months off, I feel great. You know, last season I just dicked around for 60 minutes in the pitch and then sort of fannied around for the last 20 minutes. And, you know, he was sort of laying the blame at Dyler's door for his performances. And to walk on that pitch tonight and give that performance was just... And, and we're not talking about an average player here, we're talking about the captain of Celtic. Mm -hmm. It's just... It's, it's completely and utterly unacceptable for a player like that to put in a performance like that. And, and I'm not... Suggesting that he was the worst. I mean, between him, Beaton, and Ambrose, there's nothing. There's <laughs> nothing between them. But they, they genuinely, they genuinely have to be sold. Or Brown needs to be dropped. It's very simple for me. It's, he has to be dropped. And I really hope Rogers has the balls to do what other managers haven't had the balls to do. But please, if anyone has any idea what Scott Brown offers as a Celtic 
player. Apart from snarling, growling, and looking for fights and staring at people, please <laughs> let us know because I've been racking my brain and it's not the first time I've thought this. It's not the first time I've heard this. It's not the first time I've said it. I've heard it in other podcasts. I've heard it in the pub. Like, what does he offer? And tonight, it was just... This is the, this is lower than anything under Dyla. And this, he's not even got the, the excuse of age because, I mean, like he's, he's in his early 30s, but... He should be, this should be like the kind of uh, peak of his career. You yeah. know what I mean? It, it's not as if he's a box-to-box midfielder. He doesn't need to do that much running. Well, this I, should be the way he's coming into his fucking game, but he seems yeah. to be just falling apart. And he, he, he spoke at length about being given this new creative freedom, and he joked about it feels like he's a left winger now. Aye. And yet he just can't even pass the ball. He, doesn't, he, he can't control the game. He doesn't, he doesn't influence a game. He doesn't. He barely even influences his teammates, and he's supposed to do that as his job, as his role as the captain of Celtic. So, I mean, two things, no, not two things, but two players that cannot play in the same team for me from here on in is Scott Brown and Neil Beaton. It's one or the other, and ideally neither. The, 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 thing, that I, the thing that worries me quite a bit is that we, we now have a, a new manager who is selecting the same players, basically, as the last manager. Which suggests to me that when he's watching these players in training, what is what is behind these guys is pure pish. Yeah. So Scott Allen must be fucking shite, and Blame Henderson must not be as good as we think he is. Because if is they can't get his, for some of these people, aye, if if he, they can't get in the team in front of like even though Johansson wasn't injured tonight, it wasn't fit tonight. If Johansson had been fit, he would have been in that first team. Yeah, and so that suggests to me that the guys behind them are fucking shite. I think. The manager needs to take a lot of the blame for tonight. He I does. Think, I uh, don't think. I mean, even Ronnie Dyler um, got past the, this stage. I mean, I like this. We need to put this in perspective as well. Like, I think we're still going to qualify, and I think there's not many fans that don't think we're going to qualify. But we thought we would win comfortably tonight. In fact, those guys to win one 0 were like two hundred and seventy-one. To like mm. something stupid, and I went into the bookies to try and put bets on for Celtic, like different for scorer. And Aye. places like Coral weren't even given first scorers for half the team because it was just like, now nah, what's the point? Aye. So <laughs> it just says a lot. We're, mate, we were playing against candlestick makers and people that had just finished their shift bakers. And, Aye. you know, one of the guys, I think the guy that scored was a copper. We're I'm going to put, not... put up a small like uh, case, for, case for the defence here. The first thing I would say is that, okay, like I know people are going to jump in this, but the pitch was horrendous. The pitch I've was never... absolutely abysmal. I mean, I, there were lines all over the pitch. It looked like an American football pitch, and, and the, 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 I think it's four G. You could see the ball was not gliding. No, no. Pitch. Like, in, yeah, I don't, I don't know. But for me, I'm like, why, right? Why don't we just start playing long balls then? Just start playing. It's not the ball's not moving along the ground smoothly. Just start playing long balls. Go four four two. And Aye, we're, and Griffiths up front. Yeah, we were winning uh, most things in the air, so I mean, I don't see why you wouldn't. But also, what I would say is, before that goal, we we considered so in the first half, we we had seventy six percent possession. Yeah. Which of course you need to do. You need to do things with the ball. Well, we actually did do something with the ball, which was score a perfectly legitimate goal, which yeah. was uh, ruled out. So again, you're looking at going in uh, at half time one 0 up. You're looking at being the better team who the who the other team have barely even registered an attempt in your half. Yeah. So the first half, uh, looking at it like that, you would have said that that was a fairly successful first half. You the problem we should have probably been one 0 up. We dominated possession. We didn't have many chances, but it's a shitty pitch. So and it's thirty two degrees as well. So we've just been... but it's, we've just spent twenty days in Slovenia and played some decent opposition, and the temperature there was approximately the same. Aye. I don't. I, I mean. The, the, for, for, first of all, the the Dembele goal was just was was a goal. It's criminal um, the amount of protection goalkeepers get. It's absolutely yeah. ridiculous. In fact, the referee was extremely weak tonight. He yeah. was giving them everything, blowing the whistle for everything, stop and play. One of the ones that he brought back was um, he 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 done a bounce up when a player went down. One of their players went down. I uh, we gave them the ball back, and but we done a bounce up, and the two of them like we went up, and then they went up for a competitive bounce. I was like, what? The uh, fuck? And he he stopped. The referee stopped to play for a guy getting cramp. Wow. Aye, because the guy pretended he had a he he head knock. It's just like, for fuck. It should have been booked. It should have been booked. He a pretended he had a head knock and then, it, yeah. then he lifted his leg. So he should have been yeah. booked for that. Let, let's, let's, let's not be, let's not be um, 
petty against let's the Gibraltar no, team. No, 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 let's, <laughs> let's just not. Let's just get the balls out here. Let's get Aye. the balls out and talk about how appalling Celtic were. Um, let, let me ask you this: Why was why does Brendan Rodgers take a forty-goal player and play him out of position? See, the the thing that I would say about that is that he's trying to play this four-three-three. And Scott, uh, Scott Brown, uh, Lee, Lee, Lee Griffiths in the centre. I don't think it's the best, the best thing for Celtic. I think if you've got Dembele, he plays in the centre. But what the what the problem was is that Lee Griffiths was too wide for most of it. It should have been a more kind of like you know the way like Barcelona play their three up front. It doesn't right. really matter which position they're in in the three. They kind of crisscross and stuff like that. Yeah, they inter- they interchange a lot. Aye, but with the way that we played tonight, it was almost as if Lee Griffiths was playing like a four four two winger. But if you if you if you watched the game, there were parts of the game where Griffiths was dropping deep, like he was dropping to the halfway line when Celtic were in the attack. Like he was dropping so deep, and it just was completely unnatural. But my my point here is, and I I don't think I'll ever get an answer from anyone. Why is he playing a guy who scored over forty goals last season and it out of position? Like what, what like Brendan See, Rogers? Brent, sorry, on you go, mate. No, I was just gonna say like. Lee Griffiths, for me, is not good enough for European football. So, to have the guy up front in the centre, you would need you would need to be saying that, that Lee Griffiths is the way that we're going to go forward. Lee Griffiths is the best central striker that we're going to have. And I think what Brendan Rodgers has tried to do is improve on that kind of, when we need to go one man up front, he wants someone up front that's going to be hold, holding the ball up. So that's why I think he's trying to get Dembele in there. Uh, I, I can't... I can't, I can't even back it up man like I just feel he, he, it reminds me of Dyla they did you know Dyla stuck to this rigid 4-2-3-1 system mm-hmm. and forced the players to play this position Rogers has rocked up and says 4-3-3 he's now forcing the players to play this style of foot this this formation rather and Griffiths has been pushed wide right and at the weekend or the previous game we had Henderson wide left a, a lot of the blame almost all the blame lies in Brendan Rodgers at Brendan Rodgers door for me because he didn't recognise why the fuck did he bring on James Forrest like, oh, fuck what, what, no, what, answer me this <laughs> Ryan Christie why the fuck did he start why did Patrick Roberts not start why did Patrick Roberts not start so so the, the kind of like, so first of all who, let me uh, I ask you a question first who do you think uh, if you play Lee Griffiths Central where do you play Dembele do you I play would... Dembele I would play Dembele. Why can Dembele not play? He's quite fast. Why can he not play in one of the wider positions? Because I, I think the, the point of having him is that like, for this kind of physical central forward, like a kind of Lukaku type player, you know, like battering through the middle. Right. But and if you play him... Yeah, sorry, I'm going to If you play him wing, you're going to... Yeah, if you play him in the wide the area, you're going to lose the presence in the box. So I think the only way that you can do it is either playing Lee Griffiths on the right or trying to play a 4-4-2. I would rather he went four four two then and just played the two of them up top and went out they went balls out with two traditional wingers. That that could that could have been an option, uh, but I, I don't think it's an option long term, especially if we're going to if if we go if we go four four two, the four four twos that happen in world football just now are the, the types of four four twos that get that get football stopped. We, you don't want to see Celtic play like Leicester. You don't want to see Celtic play like a Little Madrid. Any other type of four four two is just going to get overrun in the midfield. I just don't know if I just can't see a way forward with Lee Griffiths in the centre. Right, I don't know. I just feel like you play. He was your. Let's just call him what he is, our best player currently. Why are we playing him out of position? Why would you fuck up a system that's proven? Why would you? Why would you change? Why would you change something that doesn't need to be changed? Why would you fix something that doesn't need to be fixed? It makes no sense. It's 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 a it's an absolute error, and. I, if that was the case, don't even play Dembele tonight. Play Lee Griffiths where he is best suited and work around him, build around him. That that could that could uh, that could have worked. I mean, like Dem- th- yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. The thing you were going to, you, were, you were asking about uh, Christie as well. I think because I don't know if this is the reason, but Patrick Roberts yeah, usually plays on the right hand side. He does. So it seemed to be a competition between Griffiths and uh, Roberts for that position on the right. We don't really have anyone to the left. Armstrong. Is Armstrong a, a left sided forward though? Well, he was under. Why? Well, he was playing the, the, marginally behind that position when he was playing the 4 2 3 1 role. You know, he yeah. was. He, he was. He was. Dialer was lambasted for playing 
Armstrong apparently wide left when everyone played him central. He came on, he was central tonight. But Christie was fucking diabolic. Uh, he, diabolic he, he was he really, really poor. But the first 25 minutes or so of that game were just dreadful. Like, Chronic. the ball was not moving around. It was so scrappy. It was like five or six. Did you see the ball we were playing with? Ah, it looked, it looked fucking ancient, man. I think it was like the balls from the five sides in Shorland where you need to put a, a deposit, a five or deposit, when they bought it. Absolutely ridiculous. It, and, and that just highlights what we were up against tonight. The fact they weren't even using like what could be regulation balls. <laughs> we were up a against, mitre a mode master. A mitre, it, 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 it just highlights how big a, a defeat this is. And this is raw as fuck. We are recording it cut less than two hours after this defeat so this is uh, like this is a post-mortem this is like therapy <laughs> as I said to you later on we need to speak out this first we need to do this it's, it's going to be therapy like we need to get this out so what did um, you think of uh, Forrest coming in? he brings on Forrest does not bring on Roberts or McGregor and then Brown okay. Brown remains on the pitch Brendan mm-hmm. uh, uh, Bre- like tonight I'm going to say it this was worse than anything under Dyla, performance-wise, result-wise. A quick look in, on social media and, and, and some of the forums, specifically the huddle board, are saying the majority are saying, the vast majority are saying this is the worst result in our history. Mm-hmm. We are playing against a bunch of guys who have literally finished their work today and then walked <laughs> up to the rock, walked up to the rock and... <laughs> And, and have beat Celtic and they did not look like a fucking part time team we did and they fucking Some deserved it for that boy, man. they fucking That's deserved it <laughs> like let's like there's so much to talk about um, but it's I the th- fact that we barely created chances as well you know what I mean it was like we'd, I know that they had this 5-4-1 formation and it was fucking hard to get in about them but the thing that's the thing that's bothered me about Celtic over the last couple of years is that we just can't can he break teams down man and I know it's been like this. This tournament that's just passed has just been the kind of example of what if you have a good defensive unit, then it's going to take something special to kind of get through it. Yeah. But this fucking uh, Lincoln Red Imps that we're talking about here. Oh my god. You know what I mean? Like if it was if it was Portugal we were playing, then I fuck we can't score a goal. But I mean, I don't know. It just we, we, there was no space in between their defence and their midfield. There, the guy sitting there in front of the defence. They'd, they had about five defenders after that. And the the biggest ineffectual part of our team, as we've already kind of alluded to, was that central midfield. Yeah. I, I'm a great fan of Tom Rodgick, but he, he looked like Bambi on ice in that pitch. He just couldn't uh, get uh, his, uh, the ball under control. If we, if we were to sit in just now and like separate everything from this game that we spoke about and actually just talk about Tom Rogic and you know break down what he's actually good at, is getting uh, the ball on the ground, moving it around, being fast with his feet and playing some nice football. That pitch tonight... He was well fucking playing in mud in fucking Aye. quicksand for him. It Aye. was just not suited. And that, why didn't Rogers know that? Why didn't Don't Rogers know. play at the strength? This is what Dyla got fucking pelters for. Dyla got Aye. absolute dogs abuse for not doing this sort of thing. Right. And we beat, uh, and Dyla under his first uh, season, I think, was it Reykjavik? So we beat away Re- from home? It was Reykjavik. We, we beat Aye. them away from home, maybe 2 or 3 nil. And uh, then, and then this, but... Again, like as I said, when I was making the case for the defence, we we should have we should have been winning in the game. I mean, that's as simple as that. But I think it would have papered over cracks. I, I want I want the management to see that these peop- these players were not just. Sh- it wasn't because of Ronnie Dyla's shitty tactics that that we were so shite. It's because a lot of these players are not good enough. That's that's evident now that it's clear. That some of these players play for themselves and they only play when they want to, if they can even be bothered to. The lack of urgency in that midfield for the majority right. of that game is frightening. Like, and we're talking about guys that are on fifteen thousand pound a week, right. and they're first, and and they're, these these guys are bulletproof. You know, and from that, the, and the manager's point of view, from the manager's point of view. Right. and that can't fucking near be done once they play in Spain. Now that's the fucking closest he's going to get, man. I know, I'm telling you. I know. I know. <laughs> If he plays like that, he's not going to spend. And I'm going to be honest with you. See, I think I may even mentioned it in the last one that we done. And and I, you know, I was I, I've been a big fan of him. He's a he's a he's a bit classy guy, classy player uh-huh. when he wants to. Um, I was like, I was, I mean, I'd happily see Johansson go, but and, and keep beat on. I, I think I said 
I would say one and not the other, and I'd rather mm-hmm. keep beat on. But after that, like him, Ambrose, and Brown have like beat on can just get dropped, get moved, like I don't know. But the other two have to go. Brown has to be dropped, and it's <laughs> interesting. This Wolfsburg friendly on Saturday is just going to be a, a ghost side. It's going to be a ghost side be put out. Aye, aye, it's going to be aye, it's going to be murder, and we're probably going to get pumped because because Wolfsburg will be ramping up there their pre-season so yeah yeah I mean obviously you can I'm, I'm, you, for the next one we do I'd like to hear from what you what you read in the, the German press about what you think about Celtic and that but <laughs> we're still let's 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 try and swallow this and digest this fucking abysmal result so tonight. bright bright spots Tierney was fine Sweet Sweetchenko was fine Yanko it seemed to be okay but I think there was one point where they get in at the back from the in the right wing and it seemed to be he was out of position yeah. So I don't know about Yanko so much. People seem to think he can't defend or he can't track back. I don't know where they're getting this from because I've never really witnessed it. But tonight he did seem out of position in between. It was either him or Effie Ambrose. What, well, I, I would did, like. You, you, you were speaking about the wing backs here. And everything went down the flanks. There was nothing really going through the middle. And no. that's why. Why didn't he bring on. Obviously, McGregor. Eh, sorry, Rogic was on there to try that. But Rogic, as, we, as you mentioned. He just was not suited to the pitch that we're playing on, and that's something that everyone can see. So the manager has to see as well. Why not bring on McGregor? Ah, I know. I, I McGregor, know. McGregor takes players on. He's fast and he hits long distance. He hits long range shots, which we could have been doing with. But it, it just the gate like the the manager really has to have looked at that. I'm I'm not blaming anything up. I'm not I'm not looking for excuses here. The pitch was a shambles, but why didn't we recognise that and turn it to our strengths? Why did we not play it to our strengths and maybe go four four two and maybe play uh, Dembele just off of Griffiths or one or the other or you know play McGregor and get whatever? Why didn't the manager make these changes? And they brought on Armstrong, Forrest and Chifty. And Chifty actually, actually was okay. Hi, Chifty was the best of the subs, I thought. Uh, he seemed to get get in about it. But the 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 thing was again he did. He, he did a Ronnie Dyler thing where he brought uh, James Forrest on and played him in the left wing. And yeah. James James Forrest is not an inside forward. Like I know you've got the, you get these wingers like Paddy Roberts will cut inside and it will be comfortable and uh, coming in. But James Forrest can't do that. He's he's an old school win, winger. Yeah. He needs to basically be going up the right wing because he's got fuck all on the left foot. He's very one dimensional. Uh, he's like he's, Forrest. He's, He's like one of these wingers that no longer get games. He's like yeah. fucking Sean Wright Phillips, Aaron Lennon, these types yeah. of wingers. Yeah, and Josh Townsend, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, well, he's he's like a diet McGady. You know, he's, McGady was always slagged for being a one-trick pony, but he's a couple of levels below McGady. Even, and McGady had two now. feet as well, you know yeah. what I mean? Uh, yeah. Uh, and, Forrest and, left foot's are standing on only. He's, he's, it's criminal that Forrest was brought on when he's, his contract's up in a few months. Like, literally, his contract ends in five months. Aye. And he's gone, and he's announced that he's not going to sign a new contract. He's nowhere, to, and he's still getting a game. And it just everything just goes back to the manager. He's 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 and Rogers made this claim that you know he he talks a good game. Let's he he speaks with confidence. He's clear. He's charismatic. He gives off this impression that he is completely in control of everything that's happening, and that's what you want. He said when he joined us that he's watched us. I think he says he watched every game from last season. He's talking absolute pish if that's what we're seeing tonight. And he says he's watched all these games from last season. I don't buy that. From, I think from, what he said was uh, that he's seen every goal scored and goal scored uh, against us from last season. Which, if he has, then he would have seen that fucking <laughs> Ambrose. Ambrose. <laughs> Ambrose. <laughs> be in the club. But then, obviously, the only other. And I noticed that Azure and Allen were not on the bench. Aye. Uh, but I don't give a fuck. Bench. Like, get I would get Azure in there. I would get fucking Jamie McCart in there because Jamie McCart's played well in the, the preseason friendlies. You own McC- own O'Connor. Anyone, it's as simple as that. Like anyone, any swinging dick in the club, put them in at centre back because F.A. Ambrose will fuck you up the bum whenever he gets a chance. <laughs> right That's up what he does. <laughs> yeah, it's just he, up the bum every t- every I mean, time. It breaks my heart having to slag this guy, man, because he's just this big, smiley, 38-year-old pretending to be a football player who's 26 or whatever he is, and he's just, <laughs> he just cannot do anything without a catastrophic error every 
10 games like <laughs> in between that he's actually pretty good he's he can oh, i've always said about about certain defenders and he's one of them like if they have to just play on instinct and just get the ball and like dispatch it rapidly they're completely uh, fine but see if they have like two seconds to think about what they're doing they have a lot of trouble they can't, they don't know what to do given the time but if it's just based on instinct to get the ball they move it whereas if ambrose gets the ball he's like fuck fuck i've got time to do something with this he then makes a mistake and like we seen tonight he made a couple of mistakes and the way the ball actually bounced was fucking weird it sort of hit the deck and spun backwards over him and uh, it's gone and then the goal as you say it was an alright finish it was a bit of a scuff for me but yeah like overall that team that's the way bastards that. have scored against Scotland as well man is it yeah <laughs> they were, I thought I thought like they definitely um, got in our faces and they were quite sneaky and quite nasty and quite dirty but that's what you have to do to win against the bigger teams then fair play to them they can't take anything away from these these guys are just like us you know like they just do normal jobs and they just happen to kick a ball at the weekend so it must, I, be because, it must be because they're so near Spain uh, the sneakiness coming in <laughs> yeah I know and some of have all got mad names Chipolata and the Chippy Brothers and all these <laughs> mad guys <laughs> a couple of them working chippies or something like that I but, think, um, I think yeah. five of them are actually professional players so I mean they're, yeah. they're, they're not all like junior types yeah, so. yeah I mean, it's I like, still if we were to it. compare this, this team with a, a team in Scotland but you know you need to go down to the first division somewhere like Aloha it's the equivalent of like getting beat off Aloha but if we're not <laughs> we're, we're, and we've got and after everything that's happened with Celtic, all the positivity, all of the, the stem belly, the Brendan Rogers, the safe standing, all this wave of enthusiasm and positivity has just been Shut fucking up. erased, <laughs> intermittently erased. But I, 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 everything, I'm going to go back and just like, everything has to go back to Brendan Rogers. He had no plan B. It, it, it just was worse than that. It was like Dyla, but worse. And it's the exact same <laughs> things that Dyla took Pelters for. Aye, aye, like the the good thing about it is that we've we've sold our most of our season tickets before this happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going back out, man. Uh, but also, what I would say is that, uh, again, it's half time. That uh, it, it was a shocking pitch. Hopefully, this is a wake up call. Hopefully, next Wednesday or after next Wednesday, we'll be talking about how we've just pumped Gibraltar team by seven goals. I think. I think. It, I don't think the pitch size will change. I think the pitch was rigged. Maybe the pitch size will change because I don't know. I think not that it matters, but the grass, the, hopefully playing on grass, we can move the ball around. A bit and hopefully better. we'll get a decent crowd trying to yeah. try and fuck them up as well, give them, yeah. give them a few nerves and shit. But yeah, but I mean, it's, it makes me really sad because when when you when you change manager and any club change to manager, there's this, there's this like awkward transitional period that every club goes through where things are a bit unsteady. You saw it with like. Um, you know, we spoke about Mowbray. Mowbray was like an in-between manager with David Moyes was an in-between manager. We seem. I thought this transition period we were in was just going to be... I thought it was done. I thought, oh, we've signed them barely. We've got Azure in. Everything's going extremely well. The, the Rogers thing seems to be working. The friendlies weren't too bad. And then this... That's, so, that's, that's the thing. If, if the friendlies are good, then we usually get fucked well, in the well, league. So, and, and this <laughs> highlights, we have a lot of work to do as, as, a, as a club and, a, and as a team. We obviously still have to sign players, but we have to start by getting rid of many, many. A lot of those players that started that game should probably not be playing for Celtic for much longer. I, I don't, I don't know if we can afford to wait to get players out. I think we need to get players in and then just fucking try and get the players out eventually. It's, because it's, yeah, because we just don't, we don't have the time to wait till the fucking thirtieth of August for Galatasaray to come back in with two million for Scott. Uh, for uh, Johansson, you know what I mean? Celtic like to play at risky and they like to sit, you know, it's a, it's a fine line between like just waiting, just hard to just wait and just wait and see what we can do uh, and actually getting turfed out and going, fuck, we made a mistake. It's a gamble. And we've made that mistake many times in the past by not signing certain players, you know, Stephen Fletcher, for example. We missed out on him and then we never won the league. And then uh, obviously with uh, the Skepovic and Guidetti debacle, we, we signed them, it was too late and then one of them couldn't be registered for Europe and all this shit. Why not just get in there? Like the Dembele thing, that was like fucking Rogers was announced early. Dembele was announced early. All these things, it felt like it was really coming together. Aye. And it's just like I was at the bookies tonight, right? I swear to God, it was forty to one for one nil Celtic, and like twenty to one for like five nil Celtic. Jesus. <laughs> so it was you got much better odds for a low score, but if Celtic to win five nil, you were not making. As much, anywhere near as much. 
See, I mean, the kind of recent games for that club would suggest that it was never going to be a route. You know what I mean? They, they, they held Michelin quite well and uh, that, they beat, obviously beat that Estonian team. The only team I, look, I was looking back, they've been, they've been, they beat a, an Andorian team like uh, a year, year or two ago. And they get pumped off of a team from Fair Islands, 5-2, away from home I mean, in 2014. Yeah, you're brave, you're brave. Like, I have not got the heart after things like this. I don't have the heart to look at anything for a couple of days. Like, I need to just, <laughs> and, it, you know, as, as, as we are up in the History Boys Abroad or whatever, obviously I'm in Glasgow, I can't avoid this. That's one of the benefits of being <laughs> I just, abroad. I just turn, you turn just everything switch, off. Exactly, you can switch everything off, and it goes away until you decide it to come back. Whereas... If you're actually here and you're in the goldfish bowl of, of, of Celtic and Glasgow, it's going to be fucking difficult for me to avoid this. And then the fucking 12th of July as well, man. Oh my Look, god, this kids will be fucking loving it. I was at the Homeless World Cup today. Oh, were you? Was it good? It was excellent. And the India women's team would have been better in the middle of the pitch <laughs> than Brown, Beaton, and Rogic. But uh, yeah, I was at the Homeless World Cup today and uh, had lots of fun. Seen. I heard Scotland get a last minute goal or something. I never seen that game. There's there's so many games. It's like every every fifteen minutes a game starts and almost three pitches, so it's a constant thing. But um, the standard wasn't much better <laughs> tonight <laughs> than watching the, these these guys and gals from all over the world. But I. So um, how would you change it for next week? That's a question. Um. um I don't know the answer to that. I would probably rather see Griffiths through the... Just play Griffiths wherever he wants to play and wherever he's most comfortable and let him do what he's best at. I don't see the reason. I don't see much of a reason to rock the boat so soon. That's what Dyla did. Dyla came in and rocked the boat. He went, 4 2 3 one, let's go. We thought, yeah. all right, all right, okay, just calm down and just try to rush it. Obviously, with the Legia thing, we got caught out because of that. I just feel that we should really just pander to Griffiths and put him where he's best. I think the back line shouldn't change as much apart from Ambrose. Put, why don't <laughs> why don't put in Lustig? Put in Azure. Azure was Azure is seventeen. He's played professional football in the highest standard in his country and is capped by certain levels of Norwegian international. And, and he was he captain was, of his country. And he was the captain his of his his club oh. at seventeen years old. Why not play him? He's obviously got something. I and, and you mentioned the, these other young guys, O'Connell, McCart, and fuck me, put me in, I'll play centre half, I'm better, I'm better than him. And then the midfield really has to change. The midfield I has would to just change. get their names and throw them and see whatever lands in the fucking. Yeah, just yeah. pick some players, <laughs> just pick some people out there um, the, uh, the stadium. But um, Johansson's out for three weeks. Um, um, Mulgrew would have been okay in centre half tonight. I think we would have been a bit better with Mulgrew there. Um, but I think the midfield would have to change drastically. I would go with Rogic again because Celtic Park, Celtic Park, more familiar. And you just know that Brown is going to be there, and I know. Be fun. But if I could, it's going, to, it's going to be the same midfield. I guarantee it's going to be I the would, same midfield. It's going to be the same. It's going to be the same teams at Christie for Roberts. And I guarantee you, if I had my way, I would drop McGregor. Yeah, I'd play McGregor instead of Brown, Aye. and I would play Armstrong in there as well, just because we don't really have anyone else out of our 48 midfielders. Up front, as I say, I would play Griffiths as the, the number one up top, and then even if Dembele has to be dropped, remember Dembele's just a young guy, he's not even 20, Aye. I would play Paddy Roberts on the right, and I would play... Who else do we have that can play in the wide left? Gary McCarthy Steven, I think he's nah, he's, injured, but... he's he's injured and he's he's pretty garbage. <laughs> so who I don't I don't know. I don't know the Christy, answer to that. Christie uh, was shy to me. Alan? Uh, but left sided forward. I mean it, it, I know that he could play that I don't know. He's more of a central midfielder, isn't he? So I mean <laughs> I, I don't know. With with all these midfielders that we have, I'm struggling to think of one that we can actually um Play wide left, but obviously I would, I would, I would, I would definitely, definitely go with Patrick Roberts playing wide left, uh, wide right, Griffiths in the middle, and then just have a look. And I'm, I'm actually going to pull up the first team squad right now. Um, you could try, you could try Dembele on the on the right. You could, uh, I mean, you could play Henderson there on the left. I mean, sorry, yeah. Um, we've also got 
McGregor. He could play McGregor there, or even Liam Henderson. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I don't think I don't I don't like to see McGregor on the wing because I think it's now his best position and yeah. he gets pelters off the fans and stuff. So. Yeah, I mean, after that, you're kind of struggling. Then we just have, we have to ship out a lot of these players and then get some improvements in. But obviously, this is going to be this is going to take a while to go over this one. This I think I would go for I think I would go for a midfield of Neil Bouton and and the kind of defence of and uh, Callum McGregor and uh, Tom Rogic, uh and the kind of the, the other two midfield positions. I think I would maybe try. I would play Dembele through the middle again and play Griffiths on the right and I would maybe see if Roberts can play on the left. If not, then I think it's going to be either Christy or Armstrong. I mean, Yanko could play wide right. Up up top? Up top, maybe. He put, and he done quite well when he got... When, when he gets forward, he get he done quite well tonight, I thought. But I think what I think what uh, Rogers likes is somebody that's going to be cutting in on the strong side. Yeah. So I don't think he'll play a right footer up there. I think it needs to be someone that's going to play. That's I think that's why he likes Griffiths here. So the theory is that Griffiths will come in and shoot, which he did against. Uh, uh, who's that? Slovenia. Yeah, he did that twice against them. Yeah. And like I don't know, like I I like the kind of I like Griffiths in the right of the three again, as you were saying. Like if you look at that Barcelona team, I know it's fucking stupid to compare us to Barcelona, but you were getting goals from all three of the forwards. And uh, that's that should surely be the aim, you know. What I mean, get get to that stage where we're getting goals from the three forwards. I think this is this must be why we're still apparently pursuing Scott Sinclair because if he comes in, then I imagine that's the the, the, the top three complete. I know about Patrick Roberts for me is going to offer something that well we'll see. Patrick Roberts for me should have been starting to tonight's game. Uh, um, what what an option I think could be would be like uh, making it like a four three one two. Putting Dembele and Griffiths up top together and playing uh, Roberts in the hole, mm. and and then having that three man midfield as usual. But I, I can't see him changing formation. That he's not he's not used that, that formation for the whole preseason. So it's yeah. either going to be a, it's either going to be a four two three one or a four three three. So yeah, yeah, and and then yeah, it's just um, it's just difficult to to deal with this really. So <laughs> it's very very raw. A lot of the players just looked as if they didn't even care, to be honest. Not a care, but they like, like I, I, honestly, near Beaton, his uh, he, he runs in slow motion. He's he actually been, his neck did, you, touch, man. did you did you see the um, Giro when he was playing? Not that, not the uh, not the final. It was the the semi final when he he broke through and he was like one arm on the keeper, but the ball had bounced forward and he tried to run. And he's like, he was so fucking slow. <laughs> That's like Beaton. He's absolutely no urgency. Beaton plays the game at his own pace. He slows the game far. He slows the game down too much for me. And Aye. for that reason alone, it's, it's just not it's not good enough. He should be dropped for next week after the, off the back of tonight's result anyway. Do you think this uh, the result will shock the board into trying to... Expedite purchases, or do you think they're going to think, well, maybe we're not going to have any European money at all? So, I don't know. I mean, if they, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, if we I, go out on Wednesday, know, night, we've I, got that, no European football. Exactly. <laughs> I know, and, and th- th- there is a chance that we will go out next week. I'm mm-hmm. not like you're talking about it's half time, it's true. I mean, we've still got another game to go, but come on, like, as I said, the bookies are never like. The odds on that result tonight were absolutely wild. And they obviously, these wee guys came out and they gave us a game. As I said, we looked like the amateur team tonight. We no. looked like the, the Gibraltar team. We did not look like a professional bunch of guys. And this is a team that have played together for over a year, for the most part. They know mm-hmm. each other and they just looked like they didn't know each other tonight. It was just fucking shite. And I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucking done with it and I'm going to hibernate now. So we got a couple of uh, tweets about the game just after it finished. The one is from Cameron Hutton, who is at fart, uh, fat, not fart, at fat underscore Pilo on uh, Twitter. He says, "Why does Ambrose exist?" So a kind of uh, existential question about Effie Ambrose. Yeah. Um, do, do you have an answer for that? Uh, no, no I have, uh, scientists would struggle to find an answer as to why. He just I, I, again, like I find it really difficult to, to slag the guy. I'm not. I'm not really on that bandwagon of giving him powers. He just needs to be put, put <laughs> taken around the back and put down kind of thing. He just needs to look at a, a, a put to sleep. Would be nice. 
you know when I want to punch myself the face in the face the most is when I see a t- uh, Celtic lineup and he's playing right back. Yeah, that, nah, that he plays is... there for Nigeria. I mean, he'd probably do less damage at right back. But it just gives us nothing going forward at all. It's just like this complete ineffectual player. It's, oh God! Like I forgot to mention it previously, but surely Listig would be less of a bomb scare and probably more of a safe option for these next couple of games than Ambrose. Ah, uh, you'd think so. You'd think and, so. I, and Listig was on the bench tonight, and I know that he's kind of coming back from an injury, and he, had, he went to the Euros. But if he's on the bench, and it's, I'm not going to say this, but I'm going to say this. They are only a team for Gibraltar, really. Oh, so maybe oh. I know, I know, but like maybe he would have made the difference tonight. Who knows? But I, I would have been more comfortable with Lustig from the start, and I'm sure everyone else would have. I would have been more comfortable with Leo Fasan. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. But a uh, man like Blair uh, at Waffle of Sidonia on Twitter says, "Belter of a handle, to be honest." Uh, I, I, I hate football. So it yeah, actually kind of a general feeling of dismay, I would say, yeah. in, in, in the Celtic community tonight. So yeah, I think the, the the overwhelming majority is is the the overwhelming like the majority of people that I'm, I've been reading. It's like this is the worst result in history. Dyla is not to blame after all, and Brendan Rodgers has to get his finger out. I even seen some people calling for him to be sacked, and I didn't see any uh, hint of irony or white text any of that sort of thing Jesus. in these forums. So. Christ. Yeah, they're, they're, they're out in force tonight. Fuck's sake. Right, okay. Well, I guess we should move on to the the, the, the reason why we're here, and that is to discuss Paul Marcellus Wallace Elliot CBE. It's, 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 his name's not Marcellus Wallace, it's just Paul Marcellus Elliot CBE. What does the CBE stand for? Cool, big, ecky heat, I don't know. Like, <laughs> cool, don't... cool, big Elliot. Kill Big Elliot, that would do, eh? <laughs> there we go. So, I, uh, Paul Elliot, shoot. Don't know why I did a David Brent thing there, but yeah. So, obviously, I'm the man with the plan here. So, he signed for <laughs> Celtic um, in 1989, in the summer of 1989. 3rd of July, to be precise. Um, one of the things that, obviously, we, we, when we are doing this, this is a it's historical. It's, it's, you know, we're talking like 20, 20 odd, maybe thirty years ago, whatever. Mm-hmm. This is in an era where there's no social media and there's not a lot of like footage and things around to, to go by. So we're just going with what we've managed to find. Ah. But he was coming from Pisa, who were a Serie A team, and we're talking about the early late ninety, late eighties, early nineties when Serie A was in its pomp, mm-hmm. where it was. Regarded as one of the best leagues on the planet. Liverpool we were... played there. So we signed Paul Elliott from Pisa um, the season before we signed him. They were relegated in 17th place. But he's playing in Serie A, which is a very highly revered league and probably the best league in the planet at the time. And it was the beginning of like uh, the Baggio thing. And I think Baresi was still playing and Maldini was playing Costa Cotta, yada, yada, yada. He had a couple um, of cool uh, or interesting teammates as well. Who did he have in his team? He played alongside Dunga. Oh, did he play in Pisa as well? Aye, and also, I don't know if they played at the same time or it was just after, but Diego Simeone played for Pisa oh, as well. That's a Pisa nonsense, that. Aye, so a couple, a couple of hatchet midfielders uh, yeah. Pisa had. So. That's, that's, uh, I, I never, ever, never quite caught on to that. Um, I tried to find some footage of him playing, but Celtic signing a player from a league like that, quite an exotic league, Mm-hmm. Um, this big Lionel Richie lookalike with the oiled up moustache brilliant with his soul glow dripping down his back and the sallow skin he actually he looked the part and he yeah. actually came from the TV you know he was like a guy that you would see in the Serie A and he was coming from there to Celtic and we were in a position where we were about to enter this mad desolate fruitless period um, where we didn't win anything for a long time, although we did win the Scottish Cup a few months before we signed him. We beat Rangers in the final of the Scottish Cup, but we were about to enter this barren period that everyone now knows as the nine in the row years, um, which we kind of have to mention, unfortunately. But he was playing in this area with, like, as you mentioned, um, but other names were like Motor Matej, Donadoni, Biali, Van Basten, Fulit, Rijkaard, Baggio, mm-hmm. Andreas Brem. So he was playing against some decent players, um, 
and he came from the Serie A with his tan to Celtic. And, and I think it was 650,000 as well, so like a kind of Henrik Larson fee for Exactly him. what I've got noted here. The Is same that right? Thing. It's for 650,000 pound in the late 80s, probably a lot more than it was when we paid for Henrik, but 650 pound on paper, aye. Um, just to take you through the team that we kind of had at that time, um, we had Paul McStay, Steve McHale, Derek White, Lex Bailey, Anton Rogan, Boy Aiken, Peter Grant, Joe Miller, Darius Jakinowski, Mike Galloway. Approximately the, the team that we had around about that time. As I say, Celtic beat um, Rangers in the Scottish Cup final a couple of months before he signed and Joe Miller scored the goal. So there will be some other players that I haven't mentioned, but that's the that's like um, a team from when uh, the team from when Elliot had signed and he was he was uh, part of that squad. Joe Joe Miller was my hero at that and time. I love Joe Miller. I love what age Miller. were you when what, what age were you at this point? I was six, maybe. I, six, I was seven, seven. I was I, I was six or seven at the time as well. I, I was like really really small. Like that, you know that way when you're that young. Um, I was going to Celtic games when I was that young, but so long ago, it's really difficult to remember. And this was uh, like obviously, I should point out that Italia ninety was happening pretty much within twelve months of us signing uh, Paul Elliott, and obviously that again highlights how strong a league Italy was at the time and with the facilities and all that they had so Italy was probably the richest league in the planet when we took um, Paul, Elliott, Paul Elliott to Celtic but he we made could have signed Scalacci as well man if, if we could have we probably would have, I would have. <laughs> um, so we, he made his debut on the 23rd of September and I think his debut came you know we signed him in July but I think Celtic's season actually started long before he made his debut he was injured and I think he missed 10 games Aye, that's right. Due to yeah. a, a pre-season injury. In fact, um, the infamous Partizan Belgrade game, which is probably worth uh, a podcast and so on, although we don't want to talk about another defeat <laughs> so soon. Um, he was part of the squad for the first game, although he wasn't he wasn't in the squad. He was injured, but he was part of the team, I guess. And he missed the first leg. Um, I think we won two one away. Is that correct? Hey, I Mike, think. Mike Galloway scored. No, we lost two one. Um, we lost two one away. Aye, and it. Mike Galloway scored. And then obviously um the return leg, which Elliot was part of, he was he was selected in the first eleven, um, and actually got an assist in the partisan game, which was mm-hmm. was down it's down in history as one of the most mental games Celtic part ever. Um obviously finished five four. Let me ask you let me ask you a question, Graham. What 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 memories do you have of Paul Elliott at Celtic, like your overall. Obviously, we're going to take this chronologically and speak about his 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 input as a player. But what do you remember overall? I remember him like uh, having short shots. <laughs> Aye. First of all, I remember him being like <laughs> big, and uh, as as you were talking about, kind of Lionel Richie looking, kind of like suave, uh, cool guy. I also remember him being like a shining light in our defence. Yeah. Uh, look. I did obviously I didn't know so much too much about it then, but I remember people slagging off Anton Rogan. Yeah. And and looking back at that, that defence that he stepped into for the, the, the his first first game, Chris Morris, Anton Rogan, Derek White and Paul Elliott. I mean Jesus Christ on a bike. Yeah. Uh yeah, we also had yeah. And I think Paul McStay was in that squad as well. I don't know if I, I mentioned him and um but yeah. Uh the majority of people I spoke to always remember him for being one of the best defenders that we have had um, mm. throughout the really dark times, and people even compared them with some of the best defenders we they've ever seen at Celtic. He was that good, and obviously, with it being such a long time ago, we both mentioned before we done this um, that we struggled to find footage of mm. him playing games. It was it was very difficult unless we're going to get the VHSs, which is extremely <laughs> um, difficult to do these days. But I did manage to watch the the cup final where he scored the goal against Rangers. Now, this is something that everyone remembers. I've asked loads of people, what do you remember? And everyone remembers that, that header. Aye. That, it, it was like a half header, like a half volley type half header. He sort of connected his head off the deck and then pinged it in like along the ground with his head. Amazing. <laughs> against Rangers in the... Um, 
the cup final, the Skull Cup final, I should add, which was in the next season. Um, but we obviously, Celtic went on to lose that game, and he was integral in in that game in the sense that he scored the opening goal and then ran away and done a funny dance to celebrate. And his header is wild. We'll post it on Twitter. Aye. But then he, this is in the 1990-1991 season. I'm jumping ahead of it, but I just want to talk about what people remember him for. He scored the header and then um, he has to take the blame, some blame, for some of the goals that were scored, the two goals that were scored. The first one he should have challenged, it was a long ball up the pitch. I think it was fucking Richard Goff or something that's just hoofed it. And it was a header that was won and he didn't even, he sort of gingerly jumped up to challenge but didn't even. The ball was knocked down and Mark Walters, who was a friend and who convinced, a friend of Polly and convinced him to move to Celtic because I'm sure they played together prior to that, maybe Aston Villa, something like that. Maybe. They were friends anyway and he convinced. So anyway, the ball comes up. Elliot doesn't really do his job properly. Split second later, the ball's in the net, one each, and then it goes to extra time. Almost the exact same thing again. He completely mistimes his jump this time, and he's landing on his feet as the player is jumping and knocks it down. And then fucking Richard Goff scored the goal to win the game. And one thing that was odd about that game, and this is, this was the way back then, but this game, the final was played in October. Oh Which yeah, is... the, the League Cup used to be done and dusted by Christmas, didn't it? Yeah. It was played I think it's, is, it, is it that way again now? No, because they've got this new group system. Oh, so I think it's finishing earlier. I don't think it'll be finishing this side of Christmas, do you? Maybe know? January or something, I don't know. I, it always finishes, like, there's still quite a lot of football to be played in, in, in the SPL, uh, in the League. I think it's February and March it finishes at the moment, yeah. something like that. But, uh, uh, aye, so... One thing to say about Paul Elliott at this stage is that he, ha- he, he was a bit of a kind of littlest hobo of a footballer because he had a unique career where he, I don't think he, I don't think he played more than six or six games for one club. Yeah. Which is kind of like a I mean that's you're talking less than two seasons there. But he did retire early. He did retire early, early but I mean he still had quite a few clubs. He, I mean when you think about like Charlton, Luton, Aston Villa, he's stint in Italy and then obviously moves on from us. So to have uh, not that many games for each club, would, would you do you think that suggests anything about him, or do you think mm, it's just a kind of? I think it's just a quid, I think it's, it's more of a coincidence that he was a bit of a nomad footballing wise. Oh, yeah. um, as I say, he was part of a Celtic team that were in its infancy of going through this really barren period where we didn't win a lot. But like, we didn't win the league for about ten years during this period, so. Mm-hmm. He ended up moving on. Um, the ironic thing about him leaving Celtic was he actually won Player of the Year, the year he left Celtic. And I've I've managed to find quite a bit of information, not a bit of information, a lot of um, uh, opinions and thoughts and anecdotes from from uh, Kerry Dale Street forum. Uh, and if you want, I can actually go into them right now. Uh, there was a, <clears throat> excuse me. There was a fo- there was a there was a thread on. There was a, there was a thread on. Uh, Paul Elliott. The reason that we do this podcast is obviously to talk about the little intricate parts of Celtic, the stories that you might forget or you might not have heard of, or things you uh, want to know more about. Something like that, just to sort of like spark debate or interest or whatever. And Paul Elliott was one that, as you said, and as everyone else says, is that he was sort of this shining light in this shower of shit. Fucking shit. <laughs> wow, it rhymes, and it, 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 it's true. So, um, the thread was like Paul Elliott, just how good was he? And it's like I'm just going to go through some of these quotes. Uh, it took him a while to get going, but he was an awesome centre half, fearless. If you thought the Huns were scared of Bobo, dot 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 dot. Just, Someone nice. said that the best I've seen, almost unbeatable in the air. He was persecuted by the referees though, continually booked for fuck all, and the amount of times he got booked for his first tackle was shocking. Huh. After a difficult first season where he was booked about 7,000 times, slight exaggeration, <laughs> and sent off every other week, probably another exaggeration, he settled to be our best central defender in decades. If we could have kept him in team with Mark Reaper, we would have had some defence. When Paul Elliott left the club, he was one of the best two or three centre-backs in Britain. Injury then robbed him of what would have been an incredible number of England caps. He had an incredible pace as well as strength, power, presence, tactical ability, and technically he was an excellent footballer. A bit like Ambrose. 
<laughs> no, and someone you get the guy continues. I remember one day at Parkhead, he sprinted back from halfway to stop Dundee United speedster Paddy Conley with a perfect tackle on the edge of the box. Elliot had made up ten meters or so on him over a distance of about forty meters. Jesus. Okay, so here we have the the classic internet, and this is where like I, there's maybe about sixty posts in fifty nine of them. <laughs> I like what I've just mentioned. So we have this of obviously we have one guy who's like, nah, the guy's like, for fuck's sake, I can't believe the guff on here. Doogie Arnott owned him. Yeah, that's right. The wee five foot six Motherwell striker, utterly hapless against Partizan. He was reasonable and not the second coming. So it's quite funny if you read on this guy gets called an arsehole. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone's like you're nothing but a troll you fucking arsehole so <laughs> this is the internet it's just a it's just a classic example isn't it? and then someone says Arnett played well in the Scottish Cup but in that area with four decent players Boyd, Collins McStay and Elliot the rest were pish and a couple more you well, must we have had, watched... we had Jackie as well and Tommy Coyne I mean, come aye on. but they came in yeah, yeah that's <laughs> true right. uh, you must have watched a different Celtic over the past two decades or so to think he was reasonable so that's kind of finishing on a server note, but the overwhelming majority of people went on to state that he was an excellent defender. Um, he was a footballer, and he seemed to genuinely like playing for Celtic. He seemed to genuinely get it. I think Celtic were my favourite fans because I love the uh, industrious nature of, of, of the people here, the integrity, the honour. And, and that was very much reflective in their day-to-day -day character. So I, I had a great empathy with the Scottish people growing up in sort of South East London. So I think, uh, as you can see, he always had quite a good relationship with the fans as well. So yeah, kind he of seemed to respect. Yeah, he seemed to really to buy into to Celtic. And even even to this day, you still see him on TV. He's a very um, eloquent and, and progressive type of guy. He seems very open-minded, talks very very well. Um, and you know he's he's involved in a lot of these uh, anti-racism kick-out racism charities. He really does believe in equality, and he seems uh, to really have a lot of values. Um, so yeah, he seemed to buy into Celtic. But the year that he signed for Celtic, which again I'm going to reiterate, it was 1989, the 89-90 season. Celtic finished fifth mm -hmm. on 34 points, 17 points behind the filth. Mm. He did. Uh, I should point out that Celtic played in the Scottish Cup final. Um, and it went to sudden death and he scored a penalty and Anton Rogan missed I think it was the ninth penalty for I don't know it's like wild when it gets to sudden death and it's the nine penalties and poor old Anton Rogan a bit of a, a fun a figure of fun <laughs> um, he missed the he missed the penalty that sent Celtic out but yeah so we finished fifth in his first season and obviously the, 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 the funny thing about that fifth was that we were actually joint fifth with uh, Motherwell and Hibs, who all had the same points as us. So really? when you when you think about that, I mean that's basically the, this is down to like seventh fucking a joint. I think six down yeah, they, I think <laughs> that went down to goal difference, and they had like minus Aye. four and minus seven. But we were, yeah, we managed to finish fifth behind second Aberdeen, Hearts third, and Dundee United fourth. Imagine, but like having the same points total as a seventh place team in, te in, in that kind of league, you know what I mean? That's I mental. I know, it's it's really difficult to think about and yeah, it's it's mental, but it got, it got a little bit better in the next season. Fifth is obviously not even worth thinking about, um, but it wasn't until the second season he was with Celtic in, in what turned out to be his final season in 1990-1991 season, he managed to get his first goal. Which was against their United, four uh, 0 in a League Cup game in August nineteen ninety. I was so, the first game of the season, wasn't it? And perhaps. And am I right in saying? Did you say that he scored two goals in that game? He scored a double. Aye, he scored, he a, scored double. a couple. Unfortunately, yeah. we can't find these goals. But if I'm led to believe that he was a quite a big, strong, commanding guy, probably headers. Let's put a caveat in here uh, because mm. he scored a double according to the Celtic website. Mm. So as we experienced last week yes. with the Celtic website, disclaimer. <laughs> That, uh, yeah. Maybe that's not actually true. So. Yeah, yeah. It's a disclaimer. The Celtic website made big mistakes on the the Dynamo thing, um, but that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as we spoke about the, the, his most infamous moment for Celtic was scoring that header against Rangers. Am I right in saying that he did manage to score another goal against Rangers? He scored another goal against Rangers uh, to get him up to four. 
for his career, and then mm. he finished off with a goal against St. Johnson. Yeah. And the, the game against Rangers, what was the result? What was the. We could beat in both of the games. Uh, I think it was actually 2 1 in both of the games as yeah. well. It just highlights how shite it was at this period it's just to be a Celtic fan and to be part of that team. But, you know, to be to be positive and, and to, to move on, and uh, as I say, the last season we finished fifth, this season we finished third. Only 12, points, only 12 points behind Aberdeen and 14 behind the Huns. And the Huns managed to win a double that season. We're now creeping into that Hun zone where they like to flash the cash and they were spending money they didn't have. So um, that's us creeping into the EBT years again. But um, then they died, so it made it all worthwhile. And then they died, of course. It definitely made it worthwhile for me, man. It was <laughs> a good time. Uh, Tommy Coyne finished the top scorer in the league with 18 goals. He used to come into my Tesco. Uh, mm. I worked in Tesco in Barhead. He used to come in all the time. Yeah, nice I've guy. seen him. I've seen him in the south side, and I've seen uh, a couple of these guys from the south side. But I, Tommy Coyne. I think. I think the the the, the general chat about Paul Ellick was that he was a kind of modern defender, the type of defender we want in Celtic now. Like a, he gets the ball down. He doesn't hoof it and run. It's not a long ball, long ball. He actually gets the ball down and plays it in deck. And he he, he was a footballer. And he was the, commanding, but he was fast. The way you kind of spoke about him there, he just he sounded like a kind of boating or like a Chiellini or something like yeah. that. You know? It's just athletic, good on the ball, you know, like a good defender, but also a good footballer. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, these guys don't come along very often, and it would be, it would have been amazing to see um, the games that he played in, to see just how good he was compared to what we were up against. Aye. So maybe one day if we're doing a sift through our old VHSs or whatever and we come across it or if anyone has anything, please let us know. It'd be great. Um, but yeah, his last goal was against Johnston and then he went on to leave Celtic. His last game was against Infermland. Um, against Infermland in April. Celtic won 5-1. Tommy Coyne, Charlie Nicholas doubles and Derek White to make it 5. Nice. Aberdeen legend. Yeah. <laughs> he said that... Um, he came to Celtic, um, the bigger challenge coming to Celtic, it was quite difficult because there was a lot of, with the Mark Walters thing, there was the, the racism, there was a mm-hmm. lot of racism directed at certain players, um, and he felt one of the biggest issues of coming to Celtic was, was not, not just that, but like trying to get his head around the whole sectarian thing, the whole religion thing. Uh, and that I think he he didn't really understand that at first, but obviously he managed to get it. Um, but yeah, he won Player of the Year in 1990-1991, but eventually we sold to Chelsea for 1.25, so we kind of doubled our money on him. Uh, he played, uh, I think he played 66 games for Celtic and four or five goals. Uh, 66 games and four or five goals, yeah. Yeah, five goals. So um, that was three in the League Cup mm, and two in the League. Yeah. Um, as I say, it was almost unanimous that he was seen as the best centre back in decades, um, which would, you know, brought what twenty odd years. We signed him twenty years after the, the Lisbon Lions, so we're talking right back to then. So it's obviously he's held in some sort of high regard. Um, but during this time when we had these players that were pretty good, the obvious thing that happened with Celtic, and it happened back then, not so much now because they're a bit more steady and a bit more secure, is is there was boardroom rifts. Aye. And there was talk about he was after more money and he was this and he was that. And these things we spoke about um, previously about Van Hoydonk. We spoke about the Cadetti. We spoke about Paducah. And, you know, little bits in there, that here and there. But seemed to be a common theme during that, like, 10 years of the, the 90s and a little bit of the 80s. Celtic had issues. The players in the boardroom had issues, mostly over money. It's a surprise it doesn't happen anymore. We don't ever seem to have that anymore. Maybe it's because we were making promises back then that yeah. we weren't willing to actually uh, kind of actually go through with, you know? Yeah, yeah. So another quote that I've managed to find, which ties in with what I was just mentioning there, was um, another, I think I found this on one of the many Celtic forums or maybe even the Celtic Wikipedia website. Um, it goes, The great man arrived from Pisa, suffering from a virus which didn't help his game much. He didn't fuck off to Chelsea at the first sign of English money. You have to remember he played under the old board who promised him a house so he could bring his wife and daughter up from London. The house never materialised and Elliot stayed in the hotel for the entirety of his Celtic career. Shocking. I know. These factors made the decision to leave much easier for him when Chelsea came calling. 
Even then, he was torn by his gratitude to Caesar for lobbying the England setup on his behalf. The only player I ever saw run this man ragged was Cantona, and only for one piece of sublime skill, the likes of which have put the Frenchman on a different level to every player in the league at that time. A great player whose level of skill I would always want to see playing in Celtic's defence, and I'll say the same the next time someone starts a how good was Paul Fred, which should probably be what, next pre-season? So, yeah. Well, the international break. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. I mean, it's good to get that kind of perspective, and like, obviously we usually ask for tweets beforehand, but if, if you have anything to say about Paul Elliott, tweet us, and we'll, we can talk about it next week as well, so... Uh, I was looking at, uh, he did a, a Paul Elliott's Best 11 for the Celtic website, actually, yeah. only, only, only two years ago. Was that a Celtic Best 11 or an overall Best 11 he's played it, with, or his, his favourite team or whatever? He, he doesn't specify, but I'm looking at it, I think it must be the ones that he's played against or played with. Okay. Because there's Italian players in there and English and uh, Scottish, so yeah, I think it must be that. So, first of all, there's a quote, again, from the Celtic Wiki that kind of brings into this. And he says, I had the privilege of playing against Van Basten and Maradona, but in terms of my most talented teammates, there was a Brazilian called Carlos Vieira, better known as Brazilian legend Dunga, and, of course, Paul McStay at Celtic. Yeah. So, it's just to kind of get, uh, show you the, the class also of Paul McStay at that time. Yeah, yeah. So, his team was uh, David Seaman mm-hmm. uh, from Arsenal. Obviously, defenders they had three at the back, which was Alan Hansen, Franco Baresi, and Mark Lawrenson. Right. So, fuck, fuck Mark Lawrenson, he's a dick. Yeah. <laughs> midfield, four in the midfield, Rude Hullet, Frank Le- Reichard, Graham Sunnis of Sampdoria and Rangers, and uh, Michael Lerjuk. And then up front, he's got Ken Dalglish, Marco Van Basten, and Diego Maradona. So, quite quite a, a, a front three. That's yeah. prob- it's probably a better front three than Dembele. <laughs> Griffiths and uh, uh, anyone else that we want to put in the left wing. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I it, it goes into kind of uh, describe his reasons for each player. So it's actually quite a decent article if you want to type in Paul Elliott's best eleven. That's uh, the Celtic website. You'll find it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just one last quote. I mean, I've managed to do quite a lot of digging for this and spend a lot of time in forums and, and uh, my notes are all over the place. But I just want to finish on. Um, quite a funny note and I don't know whether this is true or not but let's pretend that it is true <laughs> so this was um, this was from I think it was Kerrydale Street and it said when he announced he was leaving somebody phoned the Clyde one phone in to protest about the way he was being treated one of the Clyde reporters then got Paul Elliott on the microphone to talk with this guy the guy appealed to Paul to stay and Paul was quite emotional said he would love to stay but certain circumstances had got out of control and he didn't want to leave so mm-hmm. I think that just highlights that he was very much into Celtic and the, the way things were being run by the board in those days was pushing some of our best players out the door and in turn pushing us further away from the, the standard we should have been at. And as I say, we were then going into that dark, dark period where uh-huh. we weren't winning anything and players like him would have been much better than what we were getting served up during these times. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. I it was a uh, it, it would have been good to hold on to him. I, I remember just reading actually in the Celtic Wiki that his last game was something like a, a testimonial for someone. Okay. Uh, and apparently he got like uh, carried the the players uh, the fans invaded the pitch at the end and were, were, were it was Pat Bonner's testimonial and they, they kind of started carrying him aloft and singing the uh, Paul Elliott must stay. Yeah, it was it was unanimous. Like everyone I spoke to, and I tried to speak to as many many people as I could about this. It was just that he was a great player. Everyone wanted him to stay. Nobody wanted him to leave. He's the type of defender that we actually need right now. Aye, you know, and he was one of the best players that they had saw in Celtic. I mean, it, it, obviously, when you are having a, a such a shit run of form and a, like a long extended shit run of you know seasons of nothing and shit then anyone that comes in is kind of slightly good is going to be revered. But yeah, he seemed to be an excellent player and I just wish we had the chance to to relive it and watch some more. So if anyone does have anything at all, um, if you have any sort of links or anything you want to share, please do. Aye, aye, exactly. Yeah. So I guess that's all we've got to say about Paul Elliott, but again, ask Twitter what they wanted to say about him and we got a few responses. Bobby Dazzler, uh, 
tweets in quite a lot, so thanks Bobby. Uh, at BobbyD67 on Twitter said, A five years player felt gutted when they left. But on the other hand, Pat Lowry, who is uh, at uh, Gangard Part 51 said, Sorry I can't enthuse over this guy. First year injured, second year great, third year asks away and wants a loyalty bonus. So I don't know the kind of how true that is, but I come to Pat, that's what that's what he's saying. Yeah. Uh, Celtic Vines at Celtic Vines on Twitter said, I remember him scoring a great header from a corner versus St Johnson in the early nineties down the Celtic end. Yeah. So yeah, uh, that is all we have from Twitter this week. So as always, if you want to get in touch, we're at Boys Abroad, and uh, our email uh, is historyboys at gmail dot com. So if you want to get in touch, those are the ways of doing it. Next week, we don't have anything lined up for next week, do we? Yet? No, I mean open to suggestions. Aye, aye. And we will also, have, we will, we will have one. I'd like to think we'd have one, but please suggestions first. Uh, we'll probably, I guess, we'll wait till after uh, the reckoning on Wednesday to to record. Uh, because it would be good to get a reaction to that. Hopefully, yeah. it'll be a positive one. But fuck knows, man. I'm just down in the dumps at the moment. So. Yeah, I'm going to be hiding until then. Remember, remember the last two months and the positivity. Remember that that was that was good times. Until yeah. we until we realised that it wasn't a coaching problem with these players; it was a player problem. Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to be in hibernation for the next week or so. And then maybe resurface for the. I'm I'm going to the game next week, so um, yeah, I'm kind of not looking forward to that now. Are you not a Jonah? Did we not did, did we not discover that the last time? I watched the game in Heritage tonight, and I don't ever really do that because in most games I watch in there we have shite results. So that's the last time. But I'm did you not Heritage. go to fucking Malmo? Or something I, like that? I know, I know, I know. Maybe I shouldn't <laughs> go. Maybe I shouldn't go. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Oh well. So uh, we never spoke too much about, well, we never spoke at all about the Euros, but yeah, France never won, Portugal did. I think that wraps up the Euro chat. Yep. So I guess uh, that is us for this week, so.